Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so we'll kick off. This is the second uh, press conference of uh, VEGU 21. Um, and excitingly, it's named Scientific Sleuth Sleuthing, Geoforensics and Fingerprinting. Um, and at this year's EGU, we have more than 14,000 abstracts and 16,000 people from across the globe participating in the meeting. So um, in case you weren't with us uh, for the press conference just now, my name's Erin Martin-Jones. I'm this year's EGU press conference assistant, and I'll be hosting today's session, which will include a question and answer period uh, following on from presentations by three speakers. Uh, so to allow members of the media to ask your own questions, we're conducting this, this is a Zoom meeting, obviously, um, and the best way to do this uh, is after all of our speakers have spoken, if you can then please write the letter Q in the chat box to ask a question. And of course, you're also welcome to type your questions in, and I can also read them out if that's preferable. Um, so hopefully this won't happen, but if some, for some reason Zoom suddenly quits, I'll restart the press conference and uh, give you all a few moments just to uh, rejoin the session. Uh, so for reference, you can find the abstracts and other documents relating to the press conference um, all uploaded to the documents section of the online press centre. That's uh, media.edu.eu. So you can uh, have a look there for more information. And I will introduce our three panellists now uh, to make for faster transitions uh, in between them. So yes, so this is the, the press conference theme scientific sleuthing uh, and our scientific sleuthers, if you can say that today, are, are firstly Dr. Christine Sidaway, who is a professor at Colorado College, Uni uh, United States. Uh, secondly, we have Dr. Chiara Telloli, who is a researcher at the Italian National Agency for New Technologies, Energy and Sustainable Economic Development in Italy. And last but not least, we have uh, Laura Crick, who is a doctoral candidate at the University of St. Andrews, United Kingdom. So I will now pass the floor over to each of these speakers in turn, starting with Christine, um, to introduce their topic. So Christine, are you ready? Yes, indeed. I'll go ahead and share screen. Excellent. And um, do alert me uh, while I'm screen sharing, I can't see time, so please alert me when I need to stop. I'll do. Uh, so I'd like to share with you some um, exciting results from 2019 international ocean drilling that took place on the um, continental rise of the Amundsen Sea, Antarctica. This region is of quite some interest because the nearby glaciers and ice streams of the West Antarctic ice sheets have been deemed the doomsday glaciers. The purpose of the drilling was to discover evidence um, from sediment records for paleo, paleo events that may resemble what is going on presently with ice sheet change. The major findings uh, from study of five million year old and younger deep sea sediments are that even in this very deep marine location, there are rock fragments that were rafted to the sites by icebergs. Iceberg rafting specifically occurs during deglacial events when the West Antarctic ice sheet must have retreated dramatically, possibly to alpine ice caps on high mountain ranges in West Antarctica. We characterized the rocks recovered from the deep seabed and compared them to on-land geology of Antarctica to identify where the fragments came from. There are drop stones of a unique green sandstone that could only have originated in interior mountain ranges far from the coast. Um, the West Antarctic ice sheet therefore must have been absent or dr drastically retreated at this time of ice rafting about 4 million years ago. 4 million years ago is a time that's viewed as a proxy for global climate change of the future in that there's sedimentary records from coastal areas around the Northern hemisphere showing that shorelines moved inland at that time. 
climate scientists forecast that sea levels are again on the rise and the change may come very rapidly within decades. So the, the drill sites that um, Expedition 379 to the Amundsen Sea investigated are so far from the coast of Antarctica that we could not see the continent. These are in water depths and distances that no stream, river, or beach processes could have supplied pebbles, cobbles, and um, boulders to the site. This is how we know they're ice rafted debris. The pulling up cores from the seabed is the action of this drill ship, the famed and historic Joides Resolution. Zooming in on some of those sections, we saw in the main what we expected to see, lots and lots of thinly laminated mud deposited in quiet conditions. What we were hoping for, but were almost afraid to find are iceberg rafted pebbles and granules and sometimes visible identifiable stones that are indicators of glacial events. My role in the expedition was to study these rocky particles and small pebbles and stones that were introduced into the base of the West Antarctic ice sheet by interaction of the thick ice pressing upon bedrock, transported to the edge of the continent calved off or broken and then carried into icebergs that once in the warmer ocean water melted and dropped material to the sea bottom that revealed where the ice sheet had been on the continent and where rock material must have come from. Some signature types of material are volcanic glass as is shown here. The icebergs do last a long time. Here's an ex a modern example of one of the hundreds of icebergs the Joides Resolution crew tracked, um, each of them dropping debris to the bottom. And um, the comparisons underway show um, specific sites that these icebergs and their entrained rock came from mostly along the coast of West Antarctica, showing that the sediment cores are very sensitive indicators to the advance and retreat of this ice sheet on West Antarctica. And we discovered at times that the ice sheet retreats all the way back to the Ellsworth Mountains. And when the ice sheet, here shown in a transparent layer, has melted away, stones of the type shown in this green drop stone can be floated upon icebergs along an interior passage in Antarctica to spin north out to the Scotia Sea or come out to the Amundsen Sea and drop this um, rich evidence on the seabed. So I'd like to uh, stop there and uh, look forward to hearing from our next speakers. Thank you, Christine, uh, for that. Uh, interesting introduction there. Uh, so next, let's head over to Dr. Chiara Teloli, uh, if Chiara is about. Okay. Thank you. So, but only the introduction on all my presentation. Oh, you so you can show your presentation. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, Okay, can you see? Yep, got it. Okay, so I am Chiara Telloli from the NEA Research Center in Bologna, and I'm talking about the traceability of extra virgin olive oil. So, in a fast growing expansion of the free market, together with the relative ease with which food products are transported through and between countries and continents, the safety and the quality of what we daily eat has become a real issue highlighting the structural need for measures to identify the origin of the food commodities for both consumers and the producers. Consumers demand food stuff with identifiable origin and specific characteristics. And the producers, including, for example, agricultural farmers, retailers and administrative authorities, reclaim reliable raw matters that will be put on their market. For this reason, it is important to evaluate the food traceability and the food authentication. 
food traceability covers uh, all processing, producing, and distribution steps to better characterize a food product and uh, food authentication is the comparison between same time of product uh, based on a geographical, technical, or processing difference. The approach uh, uh, on food traceability regards uh, different tasks development, uh, putting side by side uh, the increasing legislations that uh, aims uh, at uh, protecting the origin and the reputation of food commodities, preventing adulteration, and uh, uh, the continuous research on evolving instrumentation for new reliable technologies in order to reach a functioning control system. To do that, different markets have to be chosen to successfully represent the entire food chain of the product. As for example, macro and trace elements, ultra trace rare earth elements, contaminants, and isotope ratios. As a case study, uh, we collected samples of extra virgin olive oil in mills in different parts of Italy and different years. And uh, we selected extra virgin olive oil because uh, it is uh, a characteristic product of the Mediterranean area. But uh, due to its high nutritional value and high cost of production, it could be subject to fraud. Uh, so we analyzed all the samples using uh, an instrument called uh, inductive coplet plasma mass spectrometer, but in, thi in this case uh, is uh, a triple quadrupole. And uh, the implementation of high level laboratory facilities for trace element and isotopic analysis was realized at the Enea Brasimone Research Center that is near Bologna. Where are present both a clean laboratory for sample pretreatment and preparation and a clean room with uh, uh, controlled pressure, temperature and humidity in where the triple quadrupole is present. The importance of the clean room is uh, uh, to better prevent alteration due to atmospheric fallout and uh, reduce uh, natural contamination of samples, especially during trace and ultra trace analysis. So this is an example of the results. It's not easy to, to read, but only to give you an example. If you, if you see these graphs, you can show the different fingerprint of the different kinds of samples that were representative of different markers. As for example, if you see the re, uh, graph, so on the right part, in the central Italy, the extra virgin olive oil of Liguria, colored in green, shows the high value of re respect to the other extra virgin olive oil. And the same in the south of Italy is for the extra virgin olive oil of Calabria, colored in yellow. Generally, the extra virgin olive oil of the south has a high value of multi-element and a rare ultra trace element. For multi-element, we have a value um, at uh, 120 ppb, that is part per billion, respect to 40 ppb in the central Italy, so very, very small. And the same for the rare, 40 ppt, ppt is a part per trillion, so very, very small quantity, respect to 25 ppt. Uh, at the end, we analyzed all this data in a statistical analysis. It is not easy to read, but it is only to give you an example of the importance of the statistical analysis. And we use this, we using sorry, the principal component analysis called the PCA to investigate a possible relationship between extra virgin olive oil samples and analyzed element. So uh, the loading plot is uh, a correlation circle that display variables that in our case are the elements in the space. This graph uh, provides information on the correlation between the elements in which F1 and F2 represent the 60% of the variability of the element in the samples. In our case, the sample is the same because it is always extra virgin olive oil, and so there are no high differences but micro differences that can be linked, for example, or to the territory or to pollution or to adulteration, we don't know. In the tile, in these uh, loading plots, we can see that the most variable elements are represented by PC1, that uh, represented all the rare element, and the PC2 that explain some of the contaminants, like, for example, cadmium, arsenicum, 
barium and vanadium. The other element at the bottom of the graph on the left in, uh, in the yellow circle are the constant elements in the samples, such as uh, calcium, sodium, so all the elements that uh, we expected to find in the extra virgin olive oil. Taking into consideration ray and contaminants, we see that between them, there is an angle greater than 90 degrees. And it indicates that ray and contaminants are correlated to each other. That is, if ray increase in the sample, contaminants also increase. Given that the rays element indicate environmental matrix, while the contaminants anthropogenic matrix, Probably, but probably, the cultivation soil that could be contaminated. So this is only to give you an example. On uh, the other side, the B plot is used to have uh, an overall graphic idea of both samples and elements studied, in which the information of the loading plot is repeated in the B plot, but including the observation, so including the name of the samples. Uh, all the elements are present in all the samples, but in different concentration. And to understand in which concentration each element is, is present in each samples, the sample vector must be projected onto the element vector. This is an example. For example, if I um, pro project, project the vectors of Toscana and Abruzzo in green, on the manganese vector, we see that the extra virgin olive oil of Abruzzo affects manganese more than the extra virgin olive oil from Toscana. Uh, this is very difficult to read the statistical data, but uh, it uh, will be more important because uh, you can give a lot of information, especially if you have uh, a, um, a very high data, um, database. But uh, with this presentation, I want to put the attention, oh, sorry, on uh, this method, this new technology, so the ICPMS, but triple quadrupolo, because it's able to analyze trace and ultra trace elements at a very short quantity and very short concentration. And it is important in the case of the extra virgin olive oil, because it could trace the extra virgin olive oil in, in a very short concentration. In addition, um, adding the statistical analysis, it is possible to know the relationship between samples and or their origin or maybe adulteration. So this, is, this methodology is, uh, could be applied in, uh, in a very, a lot of field for a, a different kind of food products. And uh, you can know the, for example, if you have a fake food products or adulterated food products. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chiara. So uh, last but not least, let's move on to Laura Crick. Okay, is uh, that sharing okay for everybody? Yeah, that looks fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm Laura, I'm a PhD student in the St Andrews Isotope Geochemistry Labs. And today I'd like to share with you some of our data from the Toba super eruption. So why are we interested in volcanic eruptions through time? Well, we know that volcanic events can impact climate on both local and global scales. Uh, perhaps one of the best examples is the eruption of Tambora in 1815, which led to cooling across much of the Northern Hemisphere, with 1816 often referred to as the year without a summer. Going further back through time, there's potential effects on human evolution. The Toba eruption has been proposed to have caused a bottleneck in hominid populations at the time. However, this is still widely debated. So we need a continuous record of historic volcanism and particularly for our work, volcanic sulfate. So for this, we turn to the ice core records. So our ice cores are available from both the Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, for example, we have the sulfate records for an M grip in Greenland and sulfate from EDC in Antarctica. And we can see that volcanic events are easily distinguished above the background level of sulfate as these peaks. So this gives us a continuous record of volcanic sulfate going back 800,000 years in Antarctica and 110,000 years in Greenland, making them an ideal record for looking at historic volcanism. 
But also note that we see several of these bipolar peaks in the cores, where sulfate is apparently deposited simultaneously at both Arctic and Antarctic latitudes. So there's two potential mechanisms for these bipolar peaks. The first is if we have a large tropical eruption sending material high up into the stratosphere, where it can be distributed globally and deposited at both poles simultaneously. However, we'd also see a similar signal from two extratropical eruptions happening within a small time frame, and then apparently depositing at the same time. So how can we distinguish between these two scenarios? This is where we turn to the sulfur isotopes. So if we follow this schematic, if we have sulfur aerosols erupting into and above the ozone layer, they're exposed to ultraviolet radiation. This irradiation causes the aerosols to undergo photochemical reactions. And these reactions induce a mass independent fractionation or MIF signal into the sulfur. This, this MIF signal is then preserved in a sulfate and deposited in the ice cores. And above the ozone layer, this MIF signal is, not, signal is non zero. It can either be positive or negative, depending on the phase of the eruption. Whereas we'll also get sulfate in the ice cores from extratropical eruptions. Now, if sulfur from these events does not reach the ozone layer and isn't exposed to ultraviolet radiation, it won't inherit this MIF signal, so, which will be approximately zero. So we can use this mass independent fractionation to differentiate between these two scenarios. So we've applied this to the Toba eruption. Now Toba crater is located in northern Sumatra, Indonesia. And about 74,000 years ago, it underwent one of the largest eruptions of the Quaternary period. And we can see the resulting crater lake here. And multiple sulfate peaks have been identified in both Greenland and Antarctic ice cores, these bipolar events, um, within the age estimates for the Toba eruption. So we have measured, measured the sulfur isotopes for 11 of these potential candidates across two Antarctic ice cores. EDC shown here and also the EDML ice core. And from this analysis, we have identified peaks that contain only tropospheric sulfur, which are indicative of these high latitude smaller eruptions, um, so which wouldn't be Toba. And then we've also identified three sulfate peaks that contain only stratospheric sulfur. This is characteristic of a large tropical eruption therefore making these the most likely candidates for the Toba event based on our data. We've also measured the largest magnitude MIF signal that has been recorded in volcanic ice core sulfate to date. So what are the potential climatic impacts of Toba? If we look at some of other paleoclimate records from this period, we have the oxygen isotopes for the N-grip Greenland ice core in red and top panel, and then the oxygen isotopes for the Yankel speleotherm here. And we can see over this time period, they're, going, they're undergoing these significant fluctuations. So when we're interpreting these records in the, Green, in the Greenland ice cores, this correlates to cooling and warming events in Greenland. And then in the speleotherms, this indicates changes in the Asian monsoon. So if we look at around about 74,000 years ago, the time of Toba, we see we're moving into this cooling period in Greenland. And in fact, if we plot our most likely candidates for Toba based on sulfur isotopes, we find they actually lie on this transition into the cooling period, suggesting that although they may not have caused this cooling in Greenland, they may, they may still have accelerated or amplified this event. So though we've successfully managed to narrow down the Toba candidates, there's still more work that can be done using the ice cores. One of the first things we could do is measuring the sulfur isotopes for these same candidates in Greenland ice, to see if we see these same MIF signals, particularly the large magnitude events. And also identifying tephra shards in ice. When the shards are preserved, we can analyze their chemistry and match them to their potential source eruptions. And when considering sulfur preserved in ice in general, we're also looking at the diffusion of sulfate through ice and how that may affect the sulfur isotopes tens or hundreds of thousands of years 
after they've been deposited. And finally, the incorporation of volcanic plumes into photochemical models and how the import of large volumes of sulfur aerosols high into the stratosphere may be affecting the atmospheric chemistry. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to your questions. Please feel free to uh, get in touch with any further questions. And we have a research article in Climate of the Past in review currently for further information. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Laura, for that nice overview. And to all three of our speakers, we've got three fascinating and very different topics there. Um, so, as I said before, if you've got questions, um, the easiest thing is just to drop the letter Q into the chat box um, and we'll go to you for questions or you can, of course, type your question out and I can read them. Um, we have already a question in for Christine um, from Jonathan Amos. Um, so, Jonathan, should we go ahead to you? Are you able to unmute yeah, yourself? Yeah. Cool. Yes. Can you hear me? I hope yes. so. Yep. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah. And, and for Christine. Christine, thanks very much uh, for doing this. Some some quick questions, uh, which I, I hope are, are one word <laughs> answers and then uh, something that will require a little bit of explanation. Um, sure. What, what is what is the what is the distance from uh, the Ellsworth Mountains to the current ice edge and also from the Ellsworth uh, Islands uh, mountains to the drill sites, the Geordie's Resolution drill sites. Do you know those numbers? Um, I I know them in general. It's it's about one thousand kilometers from the Ellsworth Mountains to the shelf slope break, and then another three hundred kilometers to the Amundsen Sea drill site. Um, I, I will have to check the distance of the Ellsworth to the, the Scotia Sea, but I could easily email you that. Um, something that's, that's very stimulating for us is um, the, the drop stones that we have found in both of these different locations. Those sites are 3,700 kilometers apart. Um, so it, it would require, from what we understand of the oceanography, icebergs to float off the Ellsworth range in different directions, bearing the same type of rock and drop them to the seabed. Right, so okay. The West Antarctic ice sheet would need to have been considerably reduced in extent between four and three million years. Okay, which is the, the mid Pliocene. So, so the, the, the current sort of Amundsen Sea um, Ice Edge, uh, you know, the, the front of Thwaites and Pig, that 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 is about a thousand kilometers away from from from, uh, from uh, Ellsworth Mountains. Yes. Yes. From from the range itself. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, in, in the picture uh, that you showed, did you show some of this green sandstone from the mountains? Yes. Um, and what what I what I showed was a drop stone that appears in the sediment cores. And um, I, I can show that again for a moment um, by sharing my screen. Okay, so I, I won't go to the full extent, but the yeah. Uh, amazingly, the drop stone that we have is quite small, but it yeah. yielded hundreds of zircons. So we have very robust um, information from isotopic information from those special types of sand grains. Okay, so but isotopically, um, they're a distinct match for 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 the for the sandstones at Ellsworth. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. and we're we're using two indicators, not simply um, just the zircon age, but we're also using appetite fission track information. And based on that line of evidence, we we feel that the drop stone that we recovered is from a deeper level of the Ellsworth Mountains than is today exposed above the ice sheet. Okay, and the final question that requires some some explanation, uh, I guess, here is, um, you know, s snow falls on the mountains, um, it compresses into ice, and it runs downhill towards the ocean. 
you carve icebergs and um, eventually they'll drop those stones somewhere out in the ocean. Um, how come, how, can you, um, why, why couldn't these drop stones have just been, um, you know, a long, a long track journey uh, that started high up in the Ellsworth Mountains, went all the way to, you know, kind of, I mean, I know this isn't the case, but anyway, all the way to the edge of Thwaites, where it is today, carves and then travels out with with the iceberg. What what is it that that enables you to say there's no way in the mid Pliocene that that rock could have got out to that location in the Southern Ocean unless West Antarctica, as we know it today, wasn't there? Yeah, this is a fabulous question, and it does have to do with the nature of that drop stone, it is a sandstone of, you know, aggregated grains that are reasonably cemented. But it, in our view of observations from that material, it would not withstand a great deal of transport with deposition and then retransport over multiple steps of a cycle. And furthermore, it probably would not hold up well to a great deal of interaction between the ice sheet and the bedrock. It would be destroyed and disaggregated. So we be, believe it was floated on an iceberg that originated in alpine glaciers of the Ellsworth range. Um, here, here's a quick map, but um, to produce debris-laden icebergs, they're needed to have been somewhat wet-based and channelized glacier streams in alpine topography, potentially um, with a tidal um, glacier expression of the type we'd see in Southeast Alaska or British Columbia today. And we think that these green sandstones could only withstand this sort of local transport, not survive through multiple cycles to travel from the Ellsworth Mountains out to the mouth of the Amundsen Sea or north to the Scotia Sea. Fantastic, yeah. And, and, you, and you date their deposition in the muds uh, out in the ocean, yes, to, to get when they were deposited. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Yes. There's, you date, there's you date a, the muds. Yeah, there's a very strong continuous chronostratigraphy from the actual drill core themselves. So we know the age of the sediment that the iceberg rafted material resides within. Thank you so much. It's really kind. Thank you. And um, please do take advantage of the materials that I um, uploaded to the media site. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we have another question for you, Christine, coming in from Julianne. Um, and they say, knowing that the West Antarctic ice sheet must have been drastically retreated uh, millions of years ago, what does this mean for today when we are confronted with climate warming? Do your findings conform, uh, confirm the fear that the ice sheet will disappear completely? Thank you. Our, our findings do confirm that the ice sheet can disappear um, fairly rapidly and also that it can reestablish itself fairly readily. So for a geologist of the sort that I am, um, three or four or five million years is incredibly recent in time. And we, we read from very detailed records that we're striving to make more detailed that the ice sheet has collapsed back um, in a considerable extent, specifically in, in the middle Pliocene. Now, this is an interval, if we read current literature from climate modelers, that we may be entering within the next one or two decades. The climate conditions of the Pliocene are what we are expected to enter. And if warming continues at the rate that it is now, we may stay there. So we're, we're very intensely interested in these sediment records that can reveal to us what the situation in Antarctica was like at that time. Thank you for that question. Okay, thank you. Um, on to question now for Kiara. Um, and this is from Sarah Derwin. 
now that you've mapped out some chemical signatures of extra virgin olive oil, is there a way to do uh, a quick on-site testing without a clean room? I'm imagining that a quick test would be useful for those purchasing olive oil. Okay. Uh, so uh, there are two, um, two answers, one related to the on-site test and one related to the clean room. Uh, generally, um, the, the on-site test are related to um, macro element or for example, like smell, uh, but uh, um, you, can, you can't uh, know the, for example, small differences, because in this case, we wanted to analyze different kinds of extra virgin olive oil from different kinds of origin. On site, you are not able to distinguish this very small quantity with the, the um, test on site. And you have to use uh, chemical analysis in laboratory. Generally, uh, the laboratory not have uh, a clean room. For example, in Italy, mm, there aren't uh, a lot of uh, clean room. And, uh, but all the university, for example, analyze the food products. There are a lot of theses related to the food products, but they don't have a clean room. They have only a spectrometer, an ICPMS normally, and uh, they analyze the food products. In this case, uh, it depends on what uh, we want to, to do and to, to understand, because, for example, in this case, uh, the clean room uh, give you, um, you are sure to, to know the, the very small differences, and you are sure that uh, uh, what you analyze is uh, what uh, there are in the samples. And uh, uh, there aren't, for example, uh, um, adulteration, uh, uh, to the, the, the environment or other, what do you analyze on the spectrometer in a clean room is really what you have in the samples. But uh, it depends on what you have to do. Yes, in the clean room, it's not uh, so important. It, it depends. But uh, on site, uh, test on site, uh, with the test on site, you aren't able to discriminate these very short uh, differences. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chiara. Um, so uh, Sarah Derwin has another question, uh, this time for Laura. Uh, and Sarah says, how long does it take to transfer ash from a tropical volcano to make it to po uh, polar regions? I'm wondering about lag time and correlating eruptions with signatures in ice. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, so yes, when we have uh, sulfur erupted from the tropical volcanoes into the stratosphere, um, certainly in the case of the sulfur aerosols, they have resident times of sort of on the order of months to years. So it may see a delay in perhaps a month or so before sulfur starts arriving at the poles, and then it'd be deposited over a sort of several month period, depending on the size of the eruption and the um, uh, sort of the amount of sulfur that's actually been erupted and I would imagine a similar mechanism will also affect the sort of particular ash and things as well. So yeah we will see a very slight lag um, between the eruption and it actually showing um, in the ice cores. Um, though when we're sort of working tens of thousand years in the past um, that doesn't really make as much of a difference but it certainly applies to more recent events like uh, Pinatubo and Tambora. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, and Sarah says uh, faster than faster than she thought. Um, so, any further questions for our speakers today? Uh, Christine says so she's she's got to pop off, but I'm sure uh, Christine is available via email uh, for more questions. Of course, so please reach out to her. <laughs> bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Nice to be here. Bye bye. Good to have you. Thank you. Okay, any more questions for Laura and Chiara? Okay, if there's no more questions, 
we will leave it there um, and say a big thank you to our speakers uh, for those really interesting topics. Um, as I said before, please reach out to um, our speakers via email. I'm sure they'd be happy to be contacted. And also there's lots of really useful information in the press centre um, of the EG website. Uh, so feel free to head there. Um, and there are more press conferences uh, tomorrow afternoon as well.